my care was always being abused. I used to always have to call into work sick because my eyes were swollen or black and blue over here. My back peeing up, my hand hurt me. I can't go to work. But I can remember this particular night. I was home early. And so um, being a little tired, I went to bed. No bed. We didn't have a bed head. So we would rest the bed against the wall like this that is behind me. So I was sitting up and leaning on the wall that's behind me. He came home and his shirt was not ironed for work the next morning because I totally forgot. I was just tired, happy to be home early with nothing much to do. So he came in and he asked about the shirts and I'm like, I forgot. I can do it. So you've been home and what were you doing? Blah, blah, and he started. And then the next thing I knew, he slapped me. So my head spun like this. And a gush, a gush of blood flashed on the wall. Yeah, so my name is Krista Buckley. I am from the cool, 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 cool parish of Manchester, Jamaica. But currently I am residing in the Cayman Islands. I am a nurse and phlebotomist by profession, but I'm really an advocate at heart. This is more where I'm leaning to these days. And since I told my story first in 2020, 2021, thereabout, I've realized now that this is really my passion and this is my purpose. This is what, what I know. I understand why I went through what I went through so that I can be here today on for example, Women Oasis Ministry, to to tell my story, to share what I've been through so, so that someone, if it's even one person, can look into what they're going through and they can say, okay, from she went through it, she's here, she survived, and she's living her best life, as we call it. I came out of a domestic abusive marriage. I got married at the age of 21, pretty young. I... The first, well, actually, it was the first person to ask me. I, I was dating somebody before him and then started dating him, but he was the first person to ask me to marry them. I grew up in church. My great-grandfather was the pastor and founder of the church that I grew up in. And so I, I you know, I was, those beliefs were instilled in me from early um, children out of wedlock is sin and all of those things. So I, I grew up believing I grew up wanting to to I grew up wanting kingdom marriage kingdom family and all of that and so I decided to get married when I got married though I was just in my last year of nursing school and then I took on a job in Montego Bay and this is so I used to go back and forth so I used to work in Montego Montego Bay come home every uh, every fortnight then when I'd come home, this is when I'd get to spend some time with this person. And then I'd come home like Friday and I'd be gone back to work on Monday morning and I'll come back two weeks time. So when when, when I came back, I hope I can say this, this um the it was more of the love making and the sexual part of it and the, the going out. So it wasn't really getting to know him or getting or for him to know me. We were just all abuzz about that. We were happy to see each other. Couldn't wait until fortnight come for me to come home. And, you know, and then he said to me one of the times that I came up, why not just let us get married? I'm like, okay. Because I'm like, okay, then I'm seeing this person when I'm home. When I come home to Manchester, I don't even go to my parents' house first. I go to him first. And, you know, I'd go see my parents after. But we didn't really get to know each other. I didn't, I, I didn't, I thought that was it. You know, this is how you enter into marriage because you find this person and this person love you and this person can do this and this person, yada, yada, yada. And so we got married. Married. And I was still going back and forth when we got married until one day he said to me, Crystal, we're young because I was 21. He was 23 at the time. And he said, I need my wife. You, you know, I'm, I can't be living like this. I need my wife. And little did I know that he needed a wife to come home, wash, cook, clean, be his maid, be at his service. It wasn't just a wife, but he, he wanted the woman to be there. So she could do these things and I said okay that that's really true reasonable so 
I left my job in Montego I came to Manchester. I was home for a little while before I got another job in Manchester. And then I started to see a little red flags, like he'd want to meet on a Sunday. Like this is demanding now. You, you need to wash my clothes. You need to do this this way. You need to, I, I started to see that. And then I'm like, okay, you know, but, but the other things stood above it, like, <laughs> like the sexual part of it stood above it because if he'd speak to me hard and I would say, I don't like that. That's the way he'd come and try to friend me up, mm -hmm. you know? The first time he got abusive was one Sunday when um, we were to go to my goddaughter's christening. Mark you, during the week, I took the clothes out. I ironed. I said, remember, we're going to church on Sunday because my goddaughter's christening. Leading up to Sunday morning, I'm not seeing him making no movement, no efforts. I did breakfast. I started cooking dinner. You know how we, we Jamaicans, we prepare part of the Sunday dinner before we go to church. And so I started that and I'm still not seeing no movement. So I said, Remember, we're going to church, and he was like, he's not going. And I'm like, what? What do you mean by you're not going? He's not going. I said, well, anyway, come carry me then, because I need to be there as my goddaughter's christening, and, and you know all of this. He said he wouldn't carry me either. He went. He was a bus driver, so he went to wash his bus and do all of this. Okay, so I called my friend. That's her, it, it was her daughter, and I said, explain the situation. And she said, okay, I can send my brother for you. Markia was in a previous relationship with her brother. So this now triggered him because he saw the brother came for me and the brother also brought me back home. So the brother dropped me back home. I went into the house and that's where I got the first slap. He's like, I don't have any respect. Hmm? I'm, my ex-man bring me home and he's there hungry. Wait, what time church over? And look what time I'm coming home. So I'm like, You've been home, you could have cooked because I would have eaten whatever you cooked because it was your choice not to come, right? Anyway, that blew over, he apologized and he wouldn't do it again. He was upset, he was angry and it was all of that. I did not take those red flags into consideration because mm. I was thinking, I even started to blame myself. Okay, I should have finished cooking when he said he wasn't going to come. You know, I, I, should, have, I should have not gone because my husband wasn't coming, I started to blame myself, you know, and started thinking all these sort of things. Anyways, relationship went on. He became more aggressive. Leading up to that point, the, the, this was the this was the, the, the tiebreaker of, of the relationship. Mark, I was always being abused. I used to always have to call into work sick because my eyes were swollen or black and blue over here. My back peeing up, my hand hurt me. I can't go to work. But I can remember this particular night. I was home early. And so um, being a little tired, I went to bed. No bed. We didn't have a bed head. So would rest the bed against the wall like this that is behind me. So I was sitting up and leaning on the wall that's behind me. He came home and his shirt was not ironed for work the next morning because I totally forgot. I was just tired, happy to be home early with nothing much to do. So he came in and he asked about the shirt and I'm like, I forgot, I can do it. So you've been home and what were you doing? And he started. And then the next thing I knew, he slapped me. So my head spun like this. And a, bush, a gush of blood flashed on the wall. No, I was just, I was just so taken aback in the moment that the only thing I could do was, I wiped my nose. I saw that there was blood. I saw that there was blood on the wall. I tried to to wipe the wall. It wouldn't. It didn't come out so easy because you know after you start wiping blood, mm -hmm. it starts to get. Spread. And I got up and I cleaned. And all this time I was crying and I'm like. One shirt? You, you got ticked off about one shirt? And the argument started. No. What he does not, or what he did not like, was when I spoke back or when I tried to fight back. When I tried to fight back is when he would get very defensive and, like, he would pin me, my arms down, you know, with his knees, and then he would get to do, and it, it was just pure head and face lick. Anyways... I, that was a Monday night. The Thursday was my day off, and so I was home and I was washing. 
And I got a call from police, Mandeville police station to be exact, to tell me to come and bail my husband. Well, they asked me, are you Miss so-and-so? And so I'm like, yes, I am. And they're like, come and bail your husband. I'm like, bail? It was a it was a female, and she said, yes, ma'am, come and bail your husband. Mandeville police station, if so, he asked for who, who, so-and-so. And so I left the clothes I was washing. I grabbed something on, and I headed straight to Mandeville. When I got there, they gave me this bunch of papers to go get JP to sign it, all, all that, this sort of thing, to get him bailed. Uh, I was to get back to the court's office. I think it was for 3 o'clock before they closed. When I got there, it was 2.30 something. I opened, took my handbag off my shoulder, opened the bag to get the documents. My nose started to bleed. And then the police officers were saying, Miss, you can't stay in here with your nose bleeding because other people are in and out, you know. And then so I went outside. I had on a little jacket thing. I took it off. I cleaned my nose up. Then I saw a police officer that I knew who was a family friend. And he asked me, Krista, what are you doing here? And I started to explain. Anyway, he gave me a kerchief, a handkerchief. I cleaned my face up, clean up, and I went back in. When I went back in, they're saying that they have found other things for him. So he will not be bailed. He'll have to go to court tomorrow which was Friday I'm like okay there's nothing I can do so I was going back home on my way back home my nose started to bleed again and so I even had the, the taxi driver had to stop so I could switch seat from the back to the front so I could get to hold my head over and I stopped at Spalling's hospital I was like I'm not going to go home with this I stopped at Spalling's hospital while they're explaining to them, you know, it wasn't bleeding at the time, but I had the stuff to show them, the blood, the stuff that I was using. I had that to show them. And I went into the bathroom, went into the bathroom. I feel like I was about to black out and then I just, my nose started to bleed again. And I, I shouted out, nurse. And one of them ran, came to me and she she called for help. And they said, okay, they put me on a stretcher to lay down and they packed some gauze and stuff up into my nose to stop the blood. And then they were saying they're going to make me see the doctor. No, because it's starting to bleed again. So this now is a case of emergency. By the time they wheeled me into the doctor and I sat up, doctor said, okay, sit up. She turned her back to get something. And I kid you not, Dr. Holt, I vomited up the place. I vomited on my, it was just pure blood. And by the time they realized that I was throwing up, they heard I was showing up another nurse. She came with a kidney dish. And so she pushed one. I fooled that. I vomited three kidney dishes of blood. Wow. Up on, on top of what was what already came out on my clothes and all of that. And they, they started to work on me. They started to work on me. I was blocking in and out. And they asked for a contact number for somebody. You no, know, Mark, you this time. My mother and I didn't have a good relationship again because then she was always saying, you know, you're going to make the boy kill you, you know, sister, the boy, I love you, I'm going to beat you, kill you. So she didn't, we didn't really have a relationship because in the first place, when we always visit our families on a Sunday, and if he was not coming to my mother with me, I couldn't go because then he knew, you know, that I would have told them, you know, everything. And it was the same with his parents. It was like a supervised visit, you know, like a child going to, yeah, you know, and the parents have to supervise. So my mother and I didn't have a good relationship at the time. And I said, well, God, I don't have nobody else to call because he's in jail. He's locked up. So I gave them my mother's number. And I say, if she answers, she answer. If she come, look stuff, she come. If not, it is what it is. But luckily, thanks be to God, she came. You know, she brought stuff for me. And she she had to meet me at the Mandeville Hospital because they had to transfer me. And while there... <laughs> While on the way to my development, it started to bleed because they had packed it and taped it up. That didn't hold. And so right at the ambulance door, I can remember this much, that the doctor had to meet me there to do his procedure. They had to put some tubes down into it, from my nose, down into my throat, onto my stomach. And then they couldn't understand why. And then because the blood was always coming up, I don't even think I did vitals and those sort of things that you do the first time, the first that's the first you do when you get to the hospital. I didn't even have time to do that, you know? And I can remember my mother holding on to my hand and she told me that my toes were just stretching out and my fingers were stretching out and I was blocking in and out. You know, and she said she was crying and she was praying and all of that. But luckily, thanks be to God, I pulled through. I pulled through. I spent roughly a week 
in the mind of a hospital. And then to find out that I had burst a blood vessel oh behind her from the hit. Those days <laughs> when I came out of the hospital, I was probably as white as that that uh, your background yeah. there, Dr. Holt. I was yeah. bled out. Wow. I was weak. I was, I don't know. It had to be God. Mm-hmm. It had to be God. Because I don't even know where all that blood came from. You know, it had to be God. But <laughs> after I recovered, I spent recovery time at my mother. And I went back to my relationship. By this time, I went was out back. of jail. I went back because no, this time. So when he realized that I wasn't, because when I went to the hospital Thursday night, I texted a cousin of his, tell him to come to the hospital Friday morning to pick up the key so he could go to our house to get clothes to carry back to court for him. So it was in court while he realized that I was not there, but he saw the cousin and, you know, he's asking, where's Crystal? And the cousin told him, I guess after whatever i i'm not sure but the cousin told him that what 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 had happened and then listen, i saw him come to the hospital and crying now this time i couldn't talk because they had they wanted to see if my gums and other stuff were bleeding as well so they had my 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 lip taped like this plus what 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 the tubes down in my so i was all taped up i could not speak so i had to just watch him cry and like the things that were going through me i couldn't really say them you know and i was just Literally, I remember, but I was there, but I was not there, you know, because I I had to just watch him cry, watch him behave as if, you know, this is all new to him and he had nothing to do with this and, and, and all of that stuff. But like I said, I went back after this near death experience that he caused. And... I couldn't understand. I, I, I don't know. I, I had felt lost and I knew that he was, a, he was, I knew no, I knew then that he was controlling and he only wanted to have his way with me. But why was I going back? And for the life of me, I couldn't understand. It got to another point where one, one Sunday evening, he had some cousins over and I was frying some fish. And you know, you're in the kitchen and you're hot and you're sweaty. And after I did that, they are outside playing and drinking and, eating and so I went to take a shower when I went to take a shower no I wasn't this big in body so I was a little bit slimmer so I just pulled on a half a dress no bra nothing because I was hot I thought nothing of it when the cousins left Dr. Holt the man had me on the ground kicking me like a, a football is money I look what kind of dressing that for your wife and he carried on Mark you, these are people that I know. These are people that comes to our house on a regular. Well, it was three guys of them. Whenever they come to Manchester, our house is the first they come to because they say they like how I cook this and that and they come to our house. And he had me on the floor that night. I could not move. I could not get up. He, same one, after he realized what he done, he had to scoop me up, take me to the hospital. And at the hospital, he told him that I fell. I had to do x-rays. I had to do all these things. I was in bed for almost two weeks. Luckily, I didn't have any broken or fractured bones from the kicks that he he gave. But I had severe pains. And I I told somebody on another platform the other day that this has to be God because I don't have a physical scar to date. But then I had all the scars. You could see the cut on my neck, the cut in my face, the cut on my hands. But the scars are gone. I, I, you know, when you're a child and you get a cut and you, you, you can't look at it because I have a kilo on my foot from playing with my grandmother's old coal pot and that fell on my foot. And I still have that scar. But those scars, I don't have them. The Lord is you. I don't have them. Yes. And so I knew... No, I knew I know now why God took me through all of that. And I know now why God made me survive all of that. To to further date, like I said, I went back after that ordeal. Even after the Kiggins, I was still living with him. Until one day I was home again. It was another Thursday, my day off, and he said he wanted stew peas for dinner. 
No, mark you, I didn't have pigtail. He wanted pigtail with it. I didn't have the pigtail home, so I would have had to go to the store to get it. After I finished washing everything, I just drawn a little shot and I gone to, in, into the town to get the pigtail at the supermarket. I don't know who saw me and told him. So he called me and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm cooking. He's like, what are you cooking? I said, but you say you want stew peas for dinner, so that's what I'm cooking. Where you get stew peas from? I went to buy it. What did you wear? So I meant to, let's, I can't remember the exact, but for now, let's say I wore the blue shorts. That's a hold. Who told me to tell him? <laughs> he went on. Watch me when I come because you're not listen. You're not listen. And you're this and you're that. You see, the minute he said, watch me when I come, that triggered something in me. And I heard a voice in, in my head. To, I heard a voice. Don't worry, we're going to get through this one. We're, we're going to put the enemy to shame. <laughs> right? I, I don't know what he's trying. I don't know what he's trying this evening. But I can tell him I sit here to declare the honor and the glory of Jesus. He had he should have took me out when he had me. Can we know? Amen, amen. Can we know? Exactly, amen, amen. And that is the reason why you have to tell your story. Because you see, he had not, when he wanted to take you out then, <laughs> he knew yeah. that if you live, you have you're going to be transformed in the world through your story. Amen. And he should have thought about that if he made me stay alive, how I would have conquered him and everything that he is about. Didn't think about that. It seemed to have no sense, Doctor Holt. Right. No. You see, he's, he, according to John ten ten, he come to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Lord came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. So you are Amen. you are in the abundant space as we speak. And you had a very important point to make. You were talking about when you went to the to the market to get the the pig sale, the pigtail to cook mm -hmm. the, the, the um the stew peas. And I wanted to pick up on that point because that is an important point that you make in terms of how people will the influence or how persons are minds work in terms of controlling even the very clothes that you wear. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. he was that type. He controlled where I go. My, I couldn't have no friends come over. I couldn't go to no friends. I couldn't go nowhere with no friends. I had this one friend that was my best friend from high school. She was also our maid of honor. If she was coming to Jamaica, she would have to tell him personally. I couldn't just say to him, oh, my friend is here and I need to go out with her. He was very controlling. And so when he, he told me, you know, what, what he wanted for dinner, and I went out of my way to go and get it because I'm being a wife. I'm, I'm, it's my day off. I'm washing, I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, you know, so that my husband can come home to a meal. That wasn't important in it for him because I wore a shorts on the road and I was looking, and I was trying to show off, but not. And so when he said those words, like I said, Dr. Holt, something right. ticked in my brain and it said just say okay and I said okay and that was it I ran away I pack a bag I called a friend I said come carry me on my mother and I was in hiding for about maybe three days and then I I I followed my sister to the roadway one morning to get taxi to go to school and that's how he saw me because he even called my mother, you know, he was saying, oh, Crystal is missing, and I came home, and she's not there, and my mother said, well, you and your wife have to start that out. That time, I was there, mm -hmm. you know, and then when he saw me, you know, I had to just run and stop bawling out my cousin's name that was in the yard, because if he had caught me, he would have run that bus over me, no doubt about it, and I, 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 I ran away, and I was, I was at my mother's for a while, and I, I got a job, oh, by this time, by this time, after I ran away, I I, I can't remember if they fired me because I called to say that I couldn't come to work for another time. So when I was at my mother, I was not working. A friend of mine got me a little job up the road to sell cash pot. And I was like, right now anything goes. And so I took that job. And so he would know, see me on the road and know he'd know where I work. And he would pass with the window half mask just for me to see him. You know, I, I I had to always have somebody follow me to work and follow me back home, you know, because I was scared. I knew if he caught me, 
it wouldn't be pretty. And so I was at work at the cash pot place and then a police came in one day and, you know, the men were in there joking about it, saying, wonder if this is a rake because a police come in a cash pot place and whatever, they made jokes out of it. And so the policeman came to me and he said, I really came to you, but because, you know, the brawl and the thing in the shop, just walk with me. I'm like, come to me? I'm like, okay, I took a deep breath and I walked with him. He told me that he actually came to serve me as summons. A summons? For what? I know not by this now, the place that we were living then, it was from another escape that I had tried to leave him before. And so I went to rent a place in uh, by myself in my name. And then he came back to live with me because, you know, like he's sorry and he wants his marriage to work. And me like a Jamaican yam head, I, I took him back. And so the place was rented in my name. But when I ran away, when I left him with all of the bills and the everything, he smashed the place. He break the people in the window, kick down the people in the door, cover everything. He he made extensive damages to the place to spite me. And then I'm like, okay, to the police, I, I don't know why I sh- why I should be the one going to court. And mark you, the landlord was living pretty close to where I went back to live with my parents. And he never came to me and said X, Y, Z. And he knew that I was, that's why, that's how he knew where I worked, where the landlord knew how to tell the police to serve the, the summons because he knew where I worked. I was pretty close to home. He never came to me and said anything. He knew I was in Shirley. He knew I wasn't living at the house, but he still served me as summons. Anyway, I went to court. When the judge explained, I'm like, Your Honor, I I have, this was me. I had left from January. And I was explaining to him that I, I have not been living at the premises from January. But what I can do is I can talk to, to Mr. Mann and I can ask him to leave the place and pay up the, the back rent and the extensive damage. And the, the judge look at me and he's like, no, Miss Buckley, it don't work like that. No, I, I don't think he called me Miss Buckley. I think he called me my married name because we were still married. But anyway, he said it doesn't work like that. And they held on to me. I had to stay in Poros for a week until that money was paid. That was, at the time, it was 189000 I think. So my mother had to find that money. Everybody had to put them time there in 2014, 2015. That was a whole heap of money. Yeah. That was, yeah. You know? So it, it came from different areas. My friends, my family, everybody pitched in. And I paid, the, the money was paid and I came out. When I came out, I was so angry because never one day did he come there to look for me. To not even to bring a bottle of water. Nothing. You know, the police, they, they laughed at me there. They say one, one man put me in jail, but another man bring a bed for me because a friend of mine, he brought some cardboards for my bed because, you know, you know how that is how it goes. You know, and they made, they laughed at it. And when I came out, I got a police friend of mine. I said, listen, half the things that are in, almost everything that's in that house is mine. And I called the London and I said, this is the one time I'm willing to pay for the door and the lock. But if I go there and he's not there, I'm going to force my way into the house and I'm going to take my stuff out. I went to the police, I went to the moving truck and I, I, he must have smelled the rat because he left the door open and was gone wherever not. And I just went in and I took my things out. And I'm saying in all of this, God was with me. This time I don't turn big backslide and I keep dance and everything. But in all of this, God was with me because no way did I have to to bring him to court to get what I wanted. Even the divorce, it was just so easy. It came over so easy. But I'm saying after I took my things out, I guess he came home and he saw only the bed because that was really his and, and the dresser. I took everything else that was mine and left his. I guess he came now to realize that I was serious about not coming back this time because the rest of the time then when I left, I left even my clothes but this time I took everything that was mine because I had to make a decision because I realized that you made two attempts after my life to kill me and I survived them. Why am I staying? This is not love. This is not love. You know? And so when I moved out, I didn't hear from him. I didn't see him for a while. 
until I went to the U.S. embassy. And the only thing they could ask me was about husband. How long have you been married? What is your husband this? What is your husband that? And I was denied. And so I, I, I called my friend and I said, listen, put me on to your lawyer friend now because I need to do this divorce now. And I met with the lawyer and I started the divorce process. At the time, I didn't have all of that money to pay one time, but you know, he said we could come up with a plan. And then one day he called me to say, if they had to find him, then I would have to pay extra for them to find him to sign divorce. I said, no, give me a try at it. And I called him and I'm saying, you know, um, <laughs> at this time, I must have manifested Cayman in my life because my mother was in Cayman. My mother was traveling back and forth to Cayman. And I said to him, you know, mommy's trying to work up a little thing for me, but I have to be divorced first. But, you know, I love you and, you know, I'm coming back to you because we need to straighten out our, our marriage. And I said all of these things to him with a beating heart, of course. And he said, OK, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You know, but he took about three weeks to go to the lawyer's office to sign the papers. You know, one day the secretary called me and she said, describe your husband. And I started to describe him and she said, okay, it's him then, he's here. And I was like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He signed the papers. But when he signed the papers, I asked him, I said, okay, it's me who want a divorce, but let's go 70, 30. Give me 30% of the money and I'll pay the other 70. He agreed. Months passed and not getting no nothing from him. You know, I'm calling and I'm saying, you know, help me. He said, yeah, man, as soon as I get some money and re -read, and the lawyer is on my case, they need their money, and he's not forthcoming. I called him again one last time, and he said to me, stop calling my phone about money. Are you want to divorce? Are you want to take money? So you want to spend your own money? I'm like, okay, that's fine. And in less than, I would want to say about three months, in the time that he told me that, I got the job in Cayman, and I came to Cayman. And I was able to work and pay my own divorce. I don't even think up to this time we got divorced in 2019. I don't even think up to this time he knew that we're divorced because I've never spoken to him since. Oh, wow. Has he reached out to you? And I'm saying in all of this... Say that has, again, Nasa. Has he reached out to you? Did he try to reach out to you after that? Did he mm, try to reach I out I think to one you? time I saw a message on... He messaged me on Facebook Messenger to say something one time. I think it was a holiday or a birthday. I think it was a birthday. And I just said, thank you, and left it at that. He has not reached out. He has not done anything. But in all of that, I was, I was, I was, I was hurt. I was battling. I was, I was, I was at a place. I, I tried to kill myself. I tried all of that. None of it worked, you know, because people told me are you sure you want to marry to this guy because you know you're such a pretty girl and his his job and he he used to smoke and all of those things but they were seeing something that i couldn't see because it was all love for me it was all the glimmer and the glitter and all of that for me you know and another thing that drove him crazy another thing that he cursed and went on about all the way was the fact that i didn't have a child or i couldn't get pregnant I would. I don't want to say I couldn't get pregnant. It just God had His way. God had His hand upon it, and God knew that if I had had that child for Him, would have to be battling because He would use that against me, you know, His child. And that was another thing that He went on about all the while. And whenever He's cussed, He'd cuss me. Your barrenness to say I can't breed, and He He'd make me feel so. He'd belittle me. Yes, you, you know. Mm -hmm. And he, he would do all of that. Whereas his sister got pre got married and. And she got married this year and she got pregnant next year. And he, he'd use it. Look, look, look. You, you know, and he'd go on about it. Mm -hmm. But I when I came, when when I got the opportunity to come to Cayman, I took it for two reasons. My mother would not let it go. <laughs> when I went to when I went to spend that time in jail, my mother burnt all my wedding pictures and all of those stuff. And she would not let it go that, listen, I'm trying to look a better life for you. Leave Jamaica, come to Cayman, nothing to do Jamaica for you. And so that was reason number one. Reason number two, I needed the new start. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in the community now knew that he had done these things to me. And I went on every day, but I was a different person by day. 
than a different person at night. I would drink to go to sleep. I couldn't sleep unless I drink. I would party. I would do all these things to 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 quench the pain and the hurt and you know the embarrassment that I felt. So this this was an opportunity for me to start over. You know, and I saw where God I came to Cayman in 2019 and I worked the first six months. I paid off lawyer fees, had my divorce, moved out of the apartment that I was in. And I said, okay, God, let me see what you have in store for me. 2021, this is after COVID, 2020 rather, a friend of mine that we went to high school together, we used to do everything together in high school. We didn't speak. You know, and she reached out to me to say she was going on a fasting and God said she should bring me. I said, bring me. Me and a talk. Bring me. Why? Out to all of your friends, them why you want me to go up on a seven day fasting, no food, no nothing, just like a warm water. I can't do that. <laughs> this was my saying, and I'm like, but then I, I said, all right, let me, I'll try. And I was obedient. I did not do the seven days, I did three days or stuff because I was dying at day three. I could not go. But by day three, I realized because, okay, this is what I know. I think I knew about fasting. I went in without one book full of lists of things that I want from God out of this fasting. <laughs> and lo and behold, on day three, I had nothing. I got nothing from what the, the list that I went into God with. But I realized I felt light. You know, it felt like because I was I used my phone as an alarm, even though sometimes I was at work, I use my phone as an alarm to set to say pray. Sometimes I don't know I don't know what to pray to say. I just play some music and and repeat what they're saying. Because like I said, this time I'm out of church and right. mm-hmm. yes, so I would that's how I would pray. And by day three, I realized that I felt light, like something lifted, mm-hmm. and I realized that it was all the hurt and bitterness that I was carrying, you know. And I'm like, God, it, I see what you're doing here, okay? Because first I had to shed those things yes before he could get me to where he really wanted me i mean he moved me out of jamaica out of all of the things that i thought that i was in there he moved me out of that but he wanted to get me how he wanted me you know and so i had to i had to forgive now the big thing that that i had to do in that moment was i was molested as a child also and i had to just say Okay, I forgive. I let it go. Even though I did not speak about it, I did not tell my mother, to be honest. It was, it's this uh, last year, or this year, early this year, was the first I told my mother mm-hmm. that I was molested by a family member. Mm-hmm. And how that came out, because <laughs> the family member is trying to molest my smaller sister. So I realized, no, I can't, you know, this is a cycle and I need to say something. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I had to shed all of those Dr. Holes. And then I realized that I started to listen. And I was saying, devil, you're so, I was so upset with the devil because I'm saying I was going on so good, but you make my belly rule me. Because day seven, if I had gone to day seven, I would have probably get everything on my list that I went in with. Mm -hmm. But I was grateful that I, I, I had a change of heart against things. I, I let go the, the burdens that I was carrying. I had even to forgive myself right. for, for the things that I'd done to myself, the drinking and, and, and the depression that I fell into. I had to forgive myself. And that was the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Well, you had that to was allow yourself to receive God's forgiveness. Because sometimes yeah. we are don't, we don't, it's not like we need to forgive ourselves, we need to allow, receive God's forgiveness. Yes, yes. And and so in 2020, 2021, April, I gave, I, I just came to a place of total surrender. I was at, I was home one day and I just started to cry at my bedside. Like I was curled up on the mat like a little rat, you know, and I said, God, just, just, just use me. Just take me back. Just do what you have to do. But I'm tired of being here where I am. And from there, I, I it just gave me a, I don't know. I do, I was just bursting with ideas, bursting with wanting to speak about it and want to do everything. And out of that came my book. Amen. Talk a little about your book. Tell me about the book now. 
from broken to redeemed. Mm. So this is a this is a book about a young lady who survived domestic abuse. It's mostly my story, but it has a little glitches and twitches. But that's what the book is about. But the main focus of the story was that there's hope. Amen. There's hope after any situation that you've been through. There's hope after abuse, there's hope after rape, there's hope after molestation. As long as you came out alive, even if you have a few a few scars, scars. There's there is hope. The minute you, the, the, the there's minute you came out there's alive. Hope. Yes, there's, there's healing and hope. There, yes, because like I said, I don't have physical scars, but that might not be another woman's story. She may have the scars to show, but in the midst of that, you came out and you're alive. Mm-hmm. It must be a reason why God, why God took you through that. Because he, you could have died. You could have died. Some some women's story are more traumatic than mine. And they survived. Amen. So the minute you survived, it's still hope for you to live your best life. You can still be the teacher, the doctor, the whatever you had aspired. This was not a death sentence. It did not kill you. Yes. You know, I mean, there are so many women who they still want to do things, but they're stuck. I understand that. But the, the first and foremost, you have to get under a covenant with God. You have to be able to come to a place to say, God, I want to move out of this situation. Mm-hmm. And trust me, God hears. God knows. He'll answer. Amen. He did it for me. Like I said, I was a wretched old sinner. I was doing everything of the devil. You name it, I did it. But then God God showed me that, listen, I did not give you a second chance to do that. Amen. Amen. I gave you a second chance to come over here and do this. Yes. And, and so when I wrote this book, I was at work in the kitchen one morning and I heard a voice say to me, right, right right what you have a story and i started to write i I wrote on folder leaves all 16 chapters of the book and then i gave it to a friend of mine and i said listen i'm not computer tech i'm a nurse i'll tell me about needles and blood pressure and blood sugar and all of that but but i wrote this and i need it to be compiled into something and she helped me that's how I came to this book. And I've I've heard feedbacks from people who have read my book to say one of the things that intrigued them, like my sister's nanny, <laughs> she got straight to the point. She said one of the things that intrigued me about the book were the chapters, the, the, the titles of the chapters. Like the first one was Don't Hit Me, Putting on a Smile, The Test of Time, Enough is Enough, Transformational Season, the storm is over, new beginnings. You know, she said that caught her, so she needed to read about what what was under those things. But I'm saying to a young woman today, I know, like I've said before, our story will be different. Your story will be different from another woman's story. But you are in, this is happening to you because God knows what you can manage. The Bible tells us that he wouldn't give us more than what we can bear. He knows what you can manage. He also knows your potential. He knows the plan that he has for you. You know, and sometimes women are stuck in this situation because the man is the breadwinner. They have children and all of those things. I know all of them. I might not have had a child for my husband, my ex-husband, but I went through all of those. And I had to come to a place to say, listen, I have to leave because this is going to take me out. And I'm sure this would have killed my mother too, to find out that I died this way. You know, so I had to start to think about, I I had to think quick. And so I'm saying to you, I know you may feel trapped. And I know you may feel that you can't come out because you don't have a job and 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 what are you going to do? How are the children going to survive? But listen, in, in the time when I was going through this, I did not seek help because I was ashamed. And furthermore, technology wasn't that, as advanced as it is today, you can Google a helpline for domestic abuse. You can Google stuff. You can get the help 
There are a lot of women lobbying for these things. Reach out to somebody. Tell a friend. They may know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that can help you. Talk about it. Don't keep it locked up to yourself because you don't know the minute or the hour when the man go, head go chip and he might go kill you. So you need to get out today. It's not everybody you talk to or go tell people your business. It's not everybody you talk to or go laugh after you or try to bring you I try to bring you down. You have to start learning to trust somebody, talk to somebody, somebody knows somebody that can help you. Amen. Crystal, I want to ask you a question. I mean, very powerful, inspiring story. But I want to ask you, the cycle of abuse. And now, now that you're out of it, you can look back and recognize the cycle. The cycle has where you have the, the calm phase, then you have the tension, then you have the aggressive one with the eating or the abuse takes place, and then you have the honeymoon. Could you identify those types? Did you go through, how did you, how was it the cycle for you? How was the cycle for you in your situation? Because at the time you spoke about how you make it up and you know you go back together. What was it like in this cycle? Okay, mine started as I uh, have maybe a reverse first of what you just said so we like i said we weren't living together in the first half so it was um always that honeymoon feeling for me it was always that that um because of like i said anytime he'd do stuff this is how he'd come to friend me or come to kiss me up and the honeymoon phase the honeymoon phase other stuff will happen but then there was always the aggressive side mm-hmm. and like he would bury it with all these things because the minute he starts to get aggressive, I I know now that we are going to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, I know now that we are going to get into it. And no matter how, because I would walk away, oh, that would be another thing. May I talk to you? He'd always say this too. You are my wife, so I have to train you. That's what he'd always say. So I know that if I step out, like a parent with a correct child, that's how he would correct me. And his correction was hitting me. And that's his form of correction. But the 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 cycle of abuse these days from, from what I've seen compared to what I went through is really different. Different in a sense that I've seen stories where people miss the red flags like I did. Miss the red flags. We mistook them for something else. Mm-hmm. And there's this other saying that saved the man no beat him, no love your lie. Foolishness. Foolishness. And mm-hmm. so people, women, not people, women, especially the ones that call themselves dollies these days, the one that don't the ones that don't want to work because the man can give them this and the man can give them that. And so if they are to step out of the relationship, they'll have nothing. Because everything was was done by the man, and so especially in those cases, I think I differed. I I I detoured a while ago. But in those cases, especially, you'll find abuse. You'll find physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse. Yes. Because you no, know, when you step out, if the man is providing everything for you, your hair well done, your eyelashes done, your knee, you don't have to work a day in your life. And if you step out then they're going to do what they have to do to correct you. Mm-hmm. And that's his abuse. And then you can't get out because, like I said, everything you have is the man. Yes. Like the center the and so, and, yeah, and so the cycle of abuse will always continue until a woman or until women now decide that, listen, if you even work $5 a week, have your own. So in push come to shove, you know, you can leave the relationship you can leave the relationship because no, you have your own, so the man will have nothing over you. Right. And I think too, while you're on the cycle of abuse, I want to encourage our sisters to look out, just as you mentioned, the honeymoon phase is always a nice phase that everybody looks forward to and think he's going to change. I'm giving him one more chance because this yep. time around, I sure know he's going to change. He just he just apologized and he's so sorry. He cried and he bought me all of the nice good things that he knows I love. He is going to change his sign. 
So as you said about the cycle, we need to be aware that abuse is not always a straight line. But you have this honeymoon, this tension, the calmness yep. for a while, but it's going to come back to aggression. And when the aggression is, phase comes in, it doesn't move from emotional, it goes to sexual, it goes to physical, it goes to financial, where he now controls your resources and don't want, it, don't want to have you to work either. Yep. So I, just, I think we want, we want to encourage our sisters at this point to look out for the red flags, look out for the cycle, and understand each phase of the cycle so you know what is going to come next. Or if it's not even the entire cycle, but naturally it's going to explode at some point again. Yep, yep. Because, uh, like I said, the cycles can be mixed up. Yes. It, it can have started with the aggression. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, he, he he comes and he apologizes and he buys you the nice things and he's sorry. Then you have a calm. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's good for six months. You don't have no altercation. And then now this tricks you into think that, oh, he's changed. Mm-hmm. You know, and in that calm is the same honeymoon phase. And you think, oh, him changed. him not going to lick me again. But boom. Right. You know, so it's not that is a set cycle, you know, say it starts with this and then this and then this. Mm-hmm. It comes mix up, mix up based on the person. And depends on what is happening in the season at that time. Because as you said, today you can be moving from straight calm to aggression. Today the person is calm and nice and tomorrow won't eat. But why did you eat me? You just never you didn't um you didn't put my clothes together. There was yep. no tension building up. It can move yeah. straight from calm to aggression. To aggression. Right. But I want yeah. to ask you though, Crystal, as we wrap up, Gordy have a very powerful story, and I'm sure that we're going to bring it back on the platform with the other ladies another evening. <laughs> but could you tell me, I know you said you were molested as a child. Do you think that molestation had anything to do with the choice and the pattern that you the life that you know your partner that you choose feeling that you were more secure with him do you think it had anything to do with your self-esteem because generally out of molestation comes rejection yes it it, it had a lot of correlation between that and how things unfolded when you got married I didn't hear that last part. That's all. Is a correlation any, between between the molestation and how things unfolded when you got married. In your in your relationship, in that abusive oh. relationship. So as so after I analyzed the situation, I do believe that a lot of those things added up to what happened to me when I grew up without a, a father. He didn't want my mother to have me. That was the first one. And I grew up with a stepfather, but he was always in a note. I had a stepfather like in my teens, but for the latter for the years before, you know, I didn't know my father. And so you start to search for a love from a man. And this is part of why I think I was vulnerable when I became when I got molested, because this person I used to look up to. You know, I used to look to him for for love to take care of me, but then he took he, he mistook taking care of me as having sexual intercourse with me, you know. And then going through that, growing up in the church, I a matter of fact, I went into the church because I wanted to dance. I used to dance for the church. And one day the pastor said to me, He's like, Crystal, you're doing so good and you're dancing, but you're ministering through your dancing, coming to the church. And so I got baptized. I didn't even go in to, to go into the word and to become a Christian. I went in because I was my, my ministry was dancing. Mm-hmm. And I had a fell, I had a fall, and I couldn't dance for a while. And that got so frustrating until little by little I was back out into the world. So leading up to all of those, I mean, you're looking for a manly love. And like I said, it's the first man that expressed to me that, you know, let's get married and let's have children. Let's build a family. And so I jumped right into it because I was looking for that love, that shelter from a man. And then, as I say again, I missed, I, I overlooked the red flags. Not that I missed them. I saw some of them, but I was always saying, Okay, he's married now, so he will change. Right. That didn't change anything. 
that did not change anything. Like I think he even got more controlling when he knows that okay, I'm his wife and he can that what it is it is what he says goes. Oh, mm-hmm. And yes, his his character has contributed because in the street he was an ignorant man. He used to smoke. He used to do all of that. And so a lot of people would have asked me, Crystal, are you sure that you know that man is for you? But like I said, I wasn't seeing what they were seeing. Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of these factors that we we search for. Like I said, I grew up without my father. So we're looking for that manly love. A lot of things that we, we search for these and we find them in people and we just believe that this is it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so you'd just, okay, if you go to Walmart today and you realize that all the candies that you like are there, you know, you don't have to go to Walmart and go to another store and another store. You find all of them there. You're going to keep going back to Walmart exactly. because everything that you want is right there. Mm-hmm. You're not going to step out to look to see let me see if the prices are cheaper over another store. Mm-hmm. You know, you keep going back to Walmart. So that's all you're used to. Mm-hmm. You don't know what outside what outside has to offer or another store has to offer. And so that's what happened to me. I I, I overlooked the red flags and I, I didn't take the abuse. I, I, I blamed myself for most of it because I was saying, okay, what am I not doing right as a wife? You know, why? And then that, like I said, that brought my self es- self esteem down. down. That made me me. I even belittled myself. I started to question myself. I started to ask God. Then God, my mother, at the time would have had four children, and I came from a big family. And I'm like, God, then why can't I get pregnant? You know, I I have a husband. You said um kids in wedlock and all of that so I'm so I'm saying I'm, I have followed the principles of the bible so why is this happening to me mm-hmm. you know yes I used to ask God those questions because sometimes you have to get up close and personal with God because you can't see all I'll say the destruction that is ahead but you in the moment you want to know what is going on mm-hmm. and so there are a lot of factors that will contribute to another woman's another woman's story like i've said maybe they have children maybe the man is the breadwinner maybe they don't have anywhere else to go and so that's why a lot of women stay stuck in abuse because they don't have anywhere else to go mm-hmm. or they don't know any any better like i said with the candy store they don't know what's outside or they don't know what can happen if they just step out mm-hmm. when when in the, in the last phase before i came to came and i had finished with nursing I told you I went to sell cash pot and then I started to keep in I started keeping parties and I was just finished with nursing. I was just all over the place. Because I came out of Walmart and I saw was what was outside. Mm-hmm. And so I'm saying today to a woman, yes, it is hard. If I sit here and tell you that it is easy, I would be lying. Mm-hmm. I would be lying. Because there were days, Dr. Holt, when I was just, I don't want to see nobody because there's nothing that nobody can tell me to take away the pains that I was feeling. I don't want to talk to nobody. Mm-hmm. Let, let alone people. A matter of fact, he, he even used to fight me in front of his mother. Mm-hmm. And when his mother died, I said in honor of her, not him, I went to the funeral and everything. I paid my respects. But when I look back, I said, but she was never even on my side because she knew what he was doing to me. And the only thing she would say to him is, you're going to kill her? Mm-hmm. But then I, I came later to understand that he came out of a, 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 a abusive family because this is what he used to see his father do to his mother. Yeah. And then now I understand why she wouldn't say anything mm-hmm. when she saw it happen because she was going through the same thing or she had went through the same thing. But I'm not going to be silent to another woman. I'm going to tell you, listen, domestic abuse is real. It hurt. Because I don't know. I don't know, Dr. Holt, if you've ever had a hit in the face. No, but the thing is, um, we we don't have to actually get the hit or, or be abused. But the reality is, a pain is a pain. And if you are if you're experiencing pain, 
we are experiencing yeah. pain. And as you mentioned, abuse is not only about eating. It's sometimes how people speak to you. And in a very um, humiliating way that affects your self-esteem. So we want to encourage women, listen, you don't have to be eating. The signs are there. And that is when you put your foot down. If somebody begins to speak to you in a manner that you're not pleased, watch it. Stop it. Draw the yeah. line. That is a sign of abuse. And as you said, the, the, statistics, the statistics is clear. It says one in every three, I think, women. So you can imagine that you and I and another female, one of us, is, a, is exposed to domestic violence. And that's why it is not, it is not, it's not, um, it is not, it is not um, special to any particular grouping or person. It could be me, it could yes. be you, it could be anybody. Yes, yes. So when it comes out to not a respect of person. No respect of whether your socioeconomic background, your religion, or your no matter what it is. We all at some point experience some level of humiliation from from some from our partners or whatever. We want to say, listen, yeah. we recognize what it is and we are calling it what it is. It's called abuse. It is called yeah, control yeah. and manipulation. That is what it yep. is. Control and manipulation. How long were you in the relationship for? Um, we were together about seven years. Yeah, because we got married 2009. I left 2014. So we were together from roughly 2007 to 2008. So roughly seven years, seven, eight years. Okay. And, and out of the seven years, how many years would you consider to be the years of abuse? <laughs> uh, from 2010, up for five years. Okay. Well, again, let me say it was on and off because like I said, the first, the first hit was maybe months after we were married. Mm. And then there was a calm. So maybe a five year, but it was on and off. But because, like I said, I would analyze myself to try to see what I was doing wrong, mm. and so I would avoid doing those things, you know. So it was on and off for five years. Okay, I mean, how do you feel today in terms of him as a person? I know the Lord has healed you. You have you are at a better place. How do you feel today looking back? Do you have you forgiven him? I know you spoke about forgiveness and feeling and releasing that every burden. What do you have to say about that? Because that's sometimes the hardest part, releasing Listen, the person and so forgiving who. them. When when I started all of this, I had a friend that had a YouTube channel. I know I spoke about my book and whatever. And she said, yeah, man, I'm going to put you onto a platform where you talk about this. And they said, me, me love ball. You can't do that. I like to cry. My tears are very near. From I was a child, my mother always talk about it. And then I said to God, God, how, why are you doing this? How come are you doing this? You know, I love to cry. And he said, your tears are what will make people understand that you're coming from a real place. And I know, play, play, thing, yeah. come, come talk about you. Went through this. And sometimes I've been on... I probably lost count of platforms now. And and most of the times I'm crying because I still can't believe, one, I went through that. Two, I came out of all of that. If I were 19 years and you asked me about that, me, I was nice and pretty and slim them time then. Me, manly, me, oh no. I would not tolerate that. But it happened. And in, in, in the midst of it, I was... Like I was lost to all of what was happening. But the, the fact that I came out and I'm alive and I told my story and I got over that, I forgave. I, I don't carry all that hurt and that bitterness and them heavy, ugly something they no more. Amen. I feel blessed. I am grateful. I am grateful when I can meet just one person and say, listen, if you think that this is what is happening to you, walk away. Yes. It's the hardest thing to do is to walk away when we say we love a man. Because if especially especially me, when I love, I love hard. I even had to go back to God to say, God beg you, do please forgive me because I say I would never get married again. No, I have nothing to do with man. 
but I came to Cayman and I met this great man. I am, I am now engaged to be married. I had to go back to God. Thank you, Dr. Holt. I had to go back to God to say, God, forgive me. You know, because in the midst, I was angry when I said those things to you, God. I, I was angry. But then, no, you, you, you gave me a new light. You shed a new light on all these things. And I, I had to ask for forgiveness for those things. And and so um, that is why I can tell a woman that, listen, it's not the easiest thing, but it's the best thing. When you walk away and you think about, think about yourself. Think about what you want in the future. Think about what you wanted to become. Think about the fact that you, 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 you are the breadwinner for your family. You can't just sit down and roll over and play dead. You have to get up. Mm. Yes, you're going to fall. You're going to always fall. Get up and brush off and move on again. Amen. And I can guarantee you that every time that you get up and you brush off and you move on, you've gone a step higher. You've elevated your own faith. You've elevated yourself. Wow. And so, like I said, if I don't tell people my story, they never just look at me and say, oh, she used to get beaten from one. Mm -hmm. The first time I sent somebody, my, I had a different thing from the one that I sent you, Dr. Holt, and they're like, are you sure that this is what you... And I'm like, oh, yep. Yeah. Is that you? You're so this and you're so... I'm like, yep, that is my story. Mm -hmm. That is my story. But again, I cannot, I, I cannot stop saying this there is hope amen there is hope if you get a hold of this book dr holt and you read you'll find out that the character in this book is it on she, amazon it's a book on amazon yes it is uh we're we're in jamaica are you dr holt i'm in saint Catherine, spanish town spanish I mean, town i am coming to jamaica next month i'm coming to jamaica on. april so i will we'll keep in touch and i'll can yeah, i'll be where you where are you where are you going to be I'll be between Manchester and Kingston. Oh, good. So let me know so we can link up. Yes, no problem, Dr. Hope. Yeah, and but I was saying... We could in, do something in-house on the platform so you can... So let me know when you're actually coming. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. But I'm saying in the, the, the character in this book, she had to leave her husband too to see how, that the grass was greener. You know, the things that she was taught was not the things that were outside. Yes, she became big in her organization. She got everything that, let us say, that God had promised her. Mm -hmm. But she needed to move away from the situation that she was in. That was her hindrance. That was her blockage. And she moved away and she experienced God full length. And so I can say to a woman today, just take the step. Just have the conversation with yourself. That, listen, this is not worth it. This will kill me. It will kill you mentally, physically, emotionally. Amen. I so just take the step. Amen. I definitely want to connect with you when you're here so we can do some face-to-face -face sessions. Um, if, so you can actually do some face-to-face. -face. You know, the word of God says, um, I know the plans I have for you. Plans Amen. of good and not of evil. Plan to prop, prosper and not to harm. I often say that, therefore, if something is not, if, it is, if it's harm, it's not of God. Also, one of my yeah. favorite verses that I use in these sessions comes from Psalms 139, verse 14. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. And therefore, if Amen. I'm fearfully, crystal and wonderfully made, and therefore, somebody eating me or talking to me in derog derogatory ways and putting me down, it means that I don't know my self-worth. I am yeah. not fearfully yeah. and wonderfully made. So Amen. I want to um, you know, encourage you to continue to do the work. And we will definitely be connecting when you... Just let me know in advance so we can set up some face-to-face -face sessions so you can share your story. But I want to thank Amen. you, so, thank you so, so much, much Dr. Holt. for a powerful story, an inspiring story, and a one that gives hope. It has hope. Yeah. Hope is written <laughs> all over it. Amen. <laughs> hope is written all over your story. <laughs> yes. Hope. That is the glory of God. It Amen. stood all to the glory and the honor of God. He Amen. gets all the glory, Dr. Holt. Thank you so much. And just for your listeners, your viewers, I'll just tell them you can get my book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's there on Amazon if you're in Jamaica. 
Well, you can send me a message on Facebook. I am Crystal Buckley on Facebook. Uh, you can pre-order through Dr. Holt. She'll tell me, because as I say, I'll be in Jamaica next month. So you can always pre-order and I'll have them delivered. And they're they're pretty cheap, only $1,200. Okay, good. Thank you yeah. so much. I will definitely promote the book. And looking forward to that to the face to face when you're here. Thank, thank you, you thank you so much, Dr. And thank you so much yeah. for just opening up and sharing.